Welcome back to the Sampan Viking on China channel. And today, not surprisingly, we're going to be staying with Ukraine and looking at uh, what is now being regarded as phase two of Russia's special military operation inside the Ukraine. And just to start, I think it's worth looking at what was achieved in phase one, because there have been quite a number of notable achievements. Um, the obvious uh, biggest achievement has to be the securing of the Crimea. Um, the move into north of, um, of, of the Crimea has now established a belt about a hundred miles deep into uh, former Ukrainian territory from Kherson all the way up to, to the Donbass itself. This has secured um, water and power supplies into the Crimea Peninsula, and these are undoubtedly two very major objectives of any operation in their own right, um, because the Crimea is a major strategic um, possession of the Russian Federation, and it was always vulnerable to um, power shortage and water supply, um, because it is actually quite a dry peninsula, and uh, they could only produce so much coming in from uh, from the mainland of Russia. Um, out just the other side of the Sea of Azov. So they have secured this land bridge to the Donbass and a, a nice 100 mile wide strip of territory that, uh, that ends up on the south bank of the Dnieper River and extends over to the city of, uh, of Kurzon at the, at the moment. Uh, in addition to that, of course, uh, the big story has, the last few weeks has been the fighting in Mariupol. Um, Mar this fighting is now, to all intents and purposes, over. Uh, what is left of Ukrainian forces? Now, everybody's saying Azov, but I'm sure there's other Ukrainian forces in there as well. And we mustn't fall into the trap of calling every Ukrainian soldier Azov. Um, Azov are a particularly unpleasant bunch, but there are going to be plenty of ordinary Ukrainians in ordinary Ukrainian military units who would want no association with such things whatsoever. And we must, um, we must be careful of tarring everybody with the same brush, otherwise we fall into exactly the same trap that the West has fallen with its rabid Russophobia. Um, as exhibited over the course of the last month. So certainly, yes, there are some very unpleasant elements in that uh, in the city in the form of Azov. I would hope that any other elements have now surround, um, surrendered and just left the Azov ones um, by themselves. We know that they're mainly holed up, I think, now in the, um, in the uh, appropriately, the Azov steelworks, uh, and that looks presumably where they will make their final, their final stand. But the Battle of Mariupol is, I think, well and truly, uh, effectively over. It is the mopping up operation or the very final stages and nothing now that's going to be involving um, what's left of um, the residential districts. We've seen that, we've seen videos, we've seen, um, we've seen Pushkov, we've seen Radikov, Rad oh, the Chechen leader, I can't pronounce his name, sorry, um, in the, in the, uh, in this, in the, uh, in the center of uh, Mariupol and the sound of combat, although still there, is quite distant, which means it's pushed a long way away from all these main main areas. So pretty much in terms of the uh, of anywhere significant in terms of the residential population of the city, the fighting has now stopped bar one or two isolated um, uh, uh, and holding it uh, and, and a few holdouts here and there, um, the kind of thing that takes a, a week or two of, uh, of proper mopping up in order to secure. Otherwise, what we have seen is the establishment of, um, in, in places, quite a deep band of uh, occupation on the effectively the eastern, the central and eastern half of the country, stretching from the, the Dnieper River, the Dnieper River in the north, all the way down to Kherson in the south. And, and I say Dnieper rather than Kiev, because I will touch on this as well. It seems to be a, a peculiar straw man that is coming out purely from the west, where that, um, that Russia has invaded to capture the capital and overrun all of the Ukraine. And if they fail to do this, then the mission has failed. Well, I scratch my head at this because as a geopolitical junkie who follows what uh, these uh, what the leaders of these countries say very, very closely, I'm not aware in 
any instance of any leader of Russia, Mr. Putin, or any of his leading uh, ministers saying, we want to capture Kiev, we want to overrun the whole country. Um, far from it. Uh, and I have never believed Kiev was a target. I don't believe Kiev is a target now. And the reason for the massive um, buildup of forces where they are to the north and to the sides of Kiev is not necessarily for the capital itself, but because it's the line of the Dnieper and the Dnieper River is a strategic objective in its own right, because control of that boundary um, be it left east bank or west bank, um, it controls a, a major element in the control of the war itself. Um, simply trying to storm a major city like Kiev, well, they haven't got the men for it, and they haven't done anything of the preparations you'd expect to see for a storming of the city. There hasn't been widespread mass artillery. They haven't borne the black the, the uh, backfire um, bombers over to carpet bomb entire districts uh, ahead of a of an advance. These are the things that you see in major st um, stormings of major cities like Kiev, and they haven't happened. And that suggests to me that is not the intention. And of course, they haven't got anything like enough uh, enough men to do it with anyway. Um, back in 1941, <laughs> going back to the Second World War, oh, Sam Dan. Um, but when the Germans first took um, Kiev in 1941, they had a force of about half a million men. Well, the entire Russian force inside of Ukraine today is, is about no more than 200,000, even allowing for um, certain reinforcements and the Chechens and some of the others. It's still little more than 200,000. 200, even if you throw in the forces of Luhansk and Donetsk as well, uh, 250,000 tops. Well, the German army at it, you know, needed twice that number just to take one city. So I think that tells you that there's no real serious plan to storm major cities, certainly not at this stage. Um, what they have established is this wide ring around the central and eastern parts of the country, as I've said, extending often 100 miles or more in certain places, sometimes a bit less in others. Um, but I've described it, you look at it heading for the east, I describe it as the jaws of the beast. And then when you start um, thinking about encirclements coming out from the north and the south, you start to see those as the teeth. I'm being very poetic today and I, do, and I don't apologise for it. It really is just how I, how I see it. Um, and this has to be seen in context of what phase two is really all about. And I think there is only one major objective in phase two, and that is the destruction of the large Ukrainian force currently sitting dug in um, in the Donbass, which is a force of 50 to 60,000. I keep hearing. I cannot verify that, of course. I haven't been there. I haven't counted them. But this is a figure that keeps being put about by people who seem to generally well informed. Um, so either it's urban myth that has become truth through repetition, or it is indeed a general reflection of the actual troop numbers in situ in the Donbass. But this Ukrainian army is the objective of phase two, meaning, of course, its destruction. And when I, when you look at the map and you see that they are right down at the angle of the jaws, and as the lines collapse, you can see these two jaws, can I do it like, suddenly coming together and the teeth coming out as they join up with the encirclements. This is the fate that awaits that army. It can either sit where it is and be just totally overwhelmed and destroyed in situ, or it can try to break out as the lines collapse, as these jaws close, as the teeth grow out um, to bite them, uh, and run the gauntlet as they head back to get um, in, onto the west side of the Dnieper River um, to the relative safety of uh, more uh, generally Ukrainian control territory. I don't think it's going to end very well uh, for these forces. I think they are going to suffer major casualties, whether they run or, or, or stand. And it, with the fall of the Donbass force, which may actually come in all intents and purposes within a few weeks, uh, I don't think it's going to take terribly long. That will effectively be the end of the war, because this would have been the destruction of the greater part, and certainly the best equipped part, and certainly the most battle-hardened part, of the Ukrainian army. And if 60,000 and the 10 to 15,000 that were in Mariupol, well, that's well over half the regular, um, the, the regular forces of the Ukrainian army and the better half at that. So what we're then left is the, is the rump 
of the Ukrainian army and the uh, and the and the newly established national guards, the uh, the civilian volunteers. Well, this isn't going to stop a professional army for very very long, uh, and the morale loss, the, the morale break of losing such a large army, the loss of all the territory that will follow from that, because then there's absolutely nothing to stop the Russian army sweeping all the way to the Dnieper and beyond, if because the ability to hold the bridges is going to be significantly reduced. Plus, of course. Um, there are other forces around Kherson, whatever the south, which are, and the north around Kiev. At that point, uh, even holding the river becomes uh, difficult because you haven't got the manpower to hold back the Russian army on all fronts, and they can again do the final encirclement, which is west of the Dnieper, and actually cause what's left of the Russian forces to retreat all the way back into western Ukraine itself, into um, the Galicia, uh, the part that is known as, as Galicia. So it is looking pretty grim, I think, for the Ukrainians from the position that they are in. Um, this phase is going to be a bit shorter, I think, than phase one. Phase one was all about establishment. Phase one was all about judging the reaction of the Ukrainians in the initial um, initial contacts. Uh, the Ukrainians, as I said before, have made some seriously bad strategic decisions and the consequences of these decisions are now about to come back and haunt them. Um, and in a very, very literal sense, we will see how this plays out. I put it down to a couple of weeks uh, because we're already seeing inroads going into these long established fortifications in the Donbass and the block of forces which are in situ being split into multiple smaller cauldrons as the various levels of envelopment um, unfold as the jaws close the teeth grow out and the way out for these troops becomes increasingly fraught and as time goes by increasingly very very dangerous it's going to be a battle of wills in the first instance and the question is how long will this force hold before it panics and makes a break for it um, with all that that entails. Well, I think that's enough for this particular update. I'll, I'll probably give another update on some other aspects of this um, in the not too distant future. Uh, but for now, I shall sign off. I hoped you enjoy, I hope you enjoyed um, this video, if enjoy is the right word. Um, if you liked, please like. If you would like other people to hear what I have to say, please share. If you are not a subscriber, please do. It's free and it helps the channel to grow. And if you would like to leave, uh, ask a question or give an opinion on this subject or the channel in general, please leave a comment. I will reply just as quickly as I can where it is relevant for me to do so. Uh, and I look forward to you joining me on the next video.